Hey guys, welcome to the Daily Word Bible Study, a plain and simple book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse study of the entire Bible. Currently we are in Esther chapter 6. Um, again, let me just, Esther is one of the most fantastic books. Of course, I say that really about all the scripture, and it is, except Leviticus though. And even though Leviticus does have its good points. But... You know, when you read certain books like Daniel, I think, you know, I mean, just like, in, I'm, 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 I'm going to stay in the Old Testament, but like D Daniel. But Esther is one of these books. It is a love story. But it is way more than a love story. It is a story of how God used a woman to save the nation um and, and let that think in sink in for a moment there too um this book and another thing about this book he said that it is the only book in the bible that doesn't mention the name god but god is all in it um that's a little bible trivia there uh, it, I, I, I'm going to say I, it, it doesn't read as a Hollywood script. I believe that Hollywood scripts took from it because remember, this was written way before Hollywood came along. But the plot twist in this is so amazing here. So you start off, of course, with the post-exiles. Who, in this case, Esdenim does not return to Jerusalem. Ezra, um, Jer um, Nehemiah, and Esther are post-exile, meaning, uh, remember, the Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem, deports um, the, 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 the Jews away from their homeland. God decreed 70 years of this exile after 70 years uh ezra and nehemiah didn't even really go back but about 50,000 jews go back ezra and, ne and nehemiah help rebuild the temple restore the wall set up the um the, the worship the civil aspect of it the teaching of god's word okay but then they kind of go back to their post as it were their their deportation positions in the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. But Esther is uh, living in exile, okay, and would live for the rest of her life. She doesn't go back to Israel, okay, but very much aware of the God of Israel, the God of Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um. The story starts off, of course, with uh, Ahasuerus, King Ahasuerus, who gets angry at Queen Vashti because she would not reply to him. So they end up throwing her out of her position. They seek for a new wife, a new queen, and then comes, here comes Hadassah, that is Esther's Hebrew name, Hadassah. And he loves Hadassah because not only is she an extremely beautiful woman, more than that, she is a woman of character. A woman of character. She doesn't reveal that she's a Jew. Um, and so in the meantime, again, plot twist here. The king promotes Haman to number two position. And he, he, he and he says, okay, so everyone has to bow the knee. And if you kind of go back and remember in Genesis when Joseph was promoted really to the same position as Haman, not as wise or however, uh, Pharaoh said, everyone has to bow the knee to Joseph. So that kind of position had extremely great power. So 
But Mordecai refused. I'm not bound to any man. And that one thing bothered Haman so that he plotted and said, hey, he wanted to order the execution of the entire Jewish nation. And that was kind of like, really? In other words, why would you order the extermination of an entire race over one man's actions? Okay. So Mordecai tells his niece who he, he had raised Esther um, since she was a child. Her parents passed away. They're actually cousins, first cousins. But he tells her, he says, hey, you know what? You, you know, you need to go to the king. And so the king then says, hey, you know what? Hey, um, uh, she goes, well, you know, going to the king is risky. He's like, wait, girl, <laughs> uh, you, you're going to die anyway. So um, she goes to the king and says, hey, king. And he's just thrilled to see her. He says, uh, hey, well, what, what do you want? I'll give you anything. He said, come to a banquet with me. Done, right? Done. He goes to the bank. She says, come on now. What, what do you want? Just tell me. I want to give you something. And she says, come to the banquet tomorrow again. He says, done. And this is where we're going to pick up this story here. Uh, Esther, chapter 6. Now, remember, he, she invited Haman at the same time. She invited Haman. Now she, uh, And Haman is just so thrilled with himself. He goes home and he tells his wife and everybody that... Um, you know, I'm so honored, you know, and, and, and I'm the only man other than the king that, uh, you know, Queen Esther invited me to. Life is good. But he's thinking about Mordecai. That Mordecai. So the wife, <laughs> uh, remember the wife at the end of the chapter, the wife of the family says, well, build a gallows and hang them on it. Hang them and then go to the banquet. Now watch what happens. So verse six, that night, Sleep escaped the king, so he ordered the book of recording daily events to be brought and read to the king. And they found written, they found the written report of how Mordecai had informed on um, Bigdana and, and, and Teresh, two eunuchs who guarded the king's entrance when they planned to assassinate King Ahasuerus. The king inquired, well, what honor... Um, and special recognition had been given to Mordecai for this act. Now, it's kind of interesting because just also, just kind of a quick note, think about this. Most of the time, too, your good deeds may go unrecognized. The king's personal attendance replies, nothing has been done for him. And the king asks, who is in the court? Now, Haman was just entering the outer court of the palace to ask the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows he had prepared for him. Like I say, <clears throat> does this writing get better? Does this story actually get better? Verse 5, the king's attendant answered him, Haman is there standing in the court. Have him enter, the king ordered. Haman entered the king. Haman entered and the king asked him, what should be done for the band the king wants to honor? Right? <laughs> So Haman's feeling himself, y'all. Haman thought to himself, who is the king would want to honor more than me? So he... <laughs> this story is so fantastic here. Um, because you think about... Notice what Haman thinks about. He says, well, obviously the king won for me, so he's going to give him the best answer. Verse 7. Haman told the king... For the man the king wants to honor, have him bring a royal garment that the king himself has worn and a horse the king himself has ridden, which has a royal diadem on its head. Put it up, put the garment on the horse under the, char under the charge of one of the king's most noble officials and have them clothe the man uh, the king wants to honor. Parade him on the horse through the city square <coughs> and proclaim before him this is what is done for the man the king wants to honor. So he, you could probably see him preparing to be honored. The king told Haman, Harry, do it just as you propose. Take the garment and the horse for Mordecai the Jew, 
who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not leave out anything you have suggested. Wow, right? Now, of course, this is a lot more trouble because, keep this in mind, he's ordered the execution of the Jews. Isn't that right? Verse 7, so Haman took the garment and the horse. He clothed Mordecai and paraded him through the city square, crying out before him, this is what is done for the man the king wants to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman, overwhelmed, hurried off for home with his head covered. Haman told his wife, Zerus, um, um, and all his friends, everything that happened to him. His advisor and his wife, Zerus, said to him, since Mordecai is Jewish and you have begun to fall before him, you won't overcome him because your downfall is servant. certain. Wait a minute. Y'all advised him too, by the way. Just saying. And while they were still speaking with him, the eunuchs of the king arrived and rushed Haman off to the banquet Esther had prepared. Now, he also doesn't know that... Esther is Jewish. He doesn't know that she is cousin to Haman. Um, chapter 7, verse 1. The king and Haman came to the feast with Queen Esther. Once again, on the second day while drinking wine, the king asked Esther, Queen Esther, whatever you ask will be given to you. Whatever you seek, even the half of the kingdom will be done. Queen Esther asked, Queen Esther answered, If I have obtained your approval, my king, and if the king is pleased, spare my life. Now the king felt like, what? Wait a minute. Spare your life? Queen? <laughs> spare my life. This is my request. And spare my people. This is my desire. For my people have been uh, sold out to destruction, death, and extermination. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would not have I would have kept silent. Indeed, the trouble wouldn't be worth burdening the king. The king is hers, um, and has hers spoke up and asked the queen, Esther, who is this? And where is the one who would devise such a scheme? Now I gotta stop now and say now the king remember signs a lot of these decrees. So, and again, remember this this law from the Medes and Persians says that once it is signed by the king, it is irrevocable. Which kind of always shows you that the kings are not wise enough to say, what is it that I'm signing and why am I signing this? And so this time it comes back, of course, he's overwhelmed by it. Now, previously in history, they don't necessarily know about that, but Daniel experienced the same thing with the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Same Mede and Persian people got this decree, um, got this decree signed, and it was irrevocable. Verse 6, the an Esther answered, the adversary and enemy is this evil Haman. And Haman stood terrified before the king and the queen. Angered by this, the king arose from there where they were drinking wine and went to the palace garden. Haman remained to beg Queen Esther for his life because he realized the king was planning something terrible for him. Now, here is the other part of that. Even though the, you could not reverse it, you could also say, okay, throw it in. Mean, that's what happened in the story of Daniel. Okay. That the king said, throw throw the men who made me sign this decree, throw them and their family into the lions. And the lions overcame them and ate them. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the house of wine, uh, of wine drinking, Haman was falling <clears throat> on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king examined, would he actually violate the queen while I'm in this palace? And as soon as the statement left the king's mouth, Haman's face was covered. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the things you would find is that they would recline. I can't do, do it here. They would recline and eat. And um, 
and that's why it, it, it the appearance of it was well the king's first thing was what the heck is he doing he's begging of course pleading for his life verse 9 Habana one of the warrior eunuchs said there is a gallows 75 feet tall at Ham Haman's house that he made for Mordecai who gave the report that saved the king Woof. and the king commanded hang him on it and they hang Ham Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai and then the king's anger subsided um, what a sad sad thing of event why right, you could say for Haman uh, but don't feel sorry for him because he was very very uh, evil um, extremely evil okay um, uh, let's see here you know what I'm gonna do let me go to the next verse here I got well you know what I'm gonna pick it up here I'm gonna stop and uh, we'll pick it up um, uh, next time but that that this story is so amazing to me in that you know I can say I, I it doesn't get better in terms of writing right the plot lines to it um, now um because and, and also let's, let's I keep in perspective as Esther said if it was just being sold as slaves you know I wouldn't have bothered the king the, the, the significance of the story however remember wasn't so much it's a love story between the king and uh, Esther or Hadassah the the significance was how evil Haman was and, you, and this is what I'm saying when you kind of look at him and, and, and sometimes I'll say this watching people watching people um, when they're in the pathetic state like Haman was sometimes you, you can be tempted to have, feel sorry for them that there was no turning back once he realized how you know that not, he that he had ordered first of all it things of course went south for him when the man that he hated and 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 wanted to get revenge on turned out to be the, the person whom the king um whom the king honored so he didn't realize that at first um he didn't realize and then two remember he was destroying a good man and all for the fact that he wouldn't bow to him but then it goes way way off that right that not only was he going to just destroy mordecai he was going to destroy an entire race of people so that's why i say don't don't feel sorry for haman now in this particular story, his 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 family did not suffer with him, but they did say, "Ooh, it's over for you." Um, but um, that that kind of evilness, and of course it exists. That, just think about it; it exists because had, of course, Haman, and like I said before, spiritually, to me this was an act motivated by Satan, inspired by Satan, in in, in because think about it had it been successful the bloodline of Jesus would have been quenched so if you can if you can go back and say to, to, to Haman why do you want okay I I, I don't maybe I, I don't agree with it but I understand your hatred towards Mordecai but why the entire race pure evil but again motivate <coughs> excuse me motivated by Satan all right guys uh, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I'll see you in the next study.